Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, girls. How is everybody doing? Okay, how is everybody doing? Well, there's something like that. Are you hungry? Well, you can't be hungry because there's tea and crackers. <laughs> Anyways, I'd just like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone. Um, to our second edition of our She Wins Girlhood Brunch, especially for girls within our area. And we hope that today that you have a wonderful day. We hope that everybody remains present. We hope that we are not distracted by our phones. That's why I'm not giving anybody the Wi-Fi. And I hope nobody has data. <laughs> but to begin today, we want to welcome um, Tiana who's going to chair this session today. It's a girl who is all about empowering girls to lead, and this is how she's going to lead today by me giving her the mic, and she's going to do the entire um, MC for this session for today. Okay, so let's just make up a welcome. Firstly, I would like to welcome one of our participants, Elisha, to do the opening prayer. I would like to welcome everybody to She Wins, Girlhood Brunch, an initiative of I Have a Right Foundation. This is the second edition of our Girlhood Brunch program, which is designed to empower, educate, and inspire young girls to dream big. I Have a Right Foundation hosted its first She Wins Girlhood Brunch in April. The impact of that program inspired this follow-up initiative of challenging us to develop SMART goals which can support our overall development. Under the theme, The Art of Ambition as a Woman, this event aims to challenge and inspire young girls to plan effectively for our personal, academic, professional and financial growth and success. Our amazing girlhood influencers include Miss Luana Laura, founder of Finance Focus, civil engineer Jody Dangleben, who is also the pr proprietor of JD's Naturals Healthy Living Advocate, Dr. Zoraya Telemark, and environmental specialist and founder of Louisa Fang Inc., Jana McLaurence, scholar, social media influencer, Advocate and recent MBA graduate Jose Thomas from Margot will deliver the empowering girlhood keynote address. Now we would like to welcome Ms. Valerie Honore, founder and director of I Have a Right Foundation, for a brief overview of the foundation. Thank you, Tiana. So the I Have a Right Foundation, as the name suggests, is I Have a Right, which means that we empower children, girls, and youth with knowledge about their rights so that you can be better able to protect yourselves from all forms of violence and abuse. We want to create opportunities that will help you to know that you are important, to know that you are worthy, to know that you can be the best that you can be. So we hope that today, that you enjoy today, we hope that you take as much as you can from these beautiful ladies and that you ask all the questions that you have. And we just hope that you have some real fun today. Thank you very much. 
Now I'm going to give a brief report on how this girlhood program organization has impacted my life. Firstly, this organization equipped me with more knowledge and skills in preparation for the future. Secondly, it decreased societal gender stereotypes and showed me as a young lady, I can be anything I want to be and do anything I want to do. It helps me to gain confidence and self-esteem and encourages me to want to inspire other girls with what I've learned here. This organization has showed me that I am not limited by society, but only myself. This has not only made a huge impact in my life, but it is safe to say that it has made a major impact in our lives. So I just want to say thank you to the volunteers and directors who have to put such a wonderful organization in place just to accommodate us girls. I am a girl who is gorgeous. I am a girl who is important. I am a girl who is responsible. I am a girl who is loving. I am a girl who is special. We are young girls. We embark on our own separate journeys where our values and decisions form our destiny and become our legacy. We are goddesses, incredible, respectful, legendary, successful girls. I would like to present our featured speaker today. Born and raised in the Commonwealth of Dominica, also known as the Cinderella of the Caribbean, Jose J. Thomas is an ambitious young feminist. Miss Thomas was born April 7, 1996 to parents Portia Tyson, an accountant, and Joel Thomas, a farmer. Miss Thomas is the first of two girls born to her parents. Miss Thomas displayed a keen interest in academic excellence from a tender age, which extended into an undergraduate educational pursuit at Hampton University. At the end of her primary school education, she received a bursary to attend Northeast Comprehensive Secondary School and graduated with six academic awards, including Best Performance at Caribbean Exam Examination Council for successfully passing 12 CXC subjects. At the age of 17, she traveled to the United States to attend St. Margaret's School, where she graduated with honors for an independent study project which centered on the political, legal, and prison systems of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Presently, Ms. Thomas is a senior undergraduate student at Hampton University, where she excels in her studies of economics and leadership studies. An avid believer in well-roundedness, Ms. Thomas makes it a priority to delve into extracurricular activities. Outside of the classroom, Ms. Thomas separates her time as a campus ambassador for Teach for America, an on-campus tutor for the Student Success Center, and a student researcher and a vice president of the Economics and Entrepreneur Students Club. Ms. Thomas was recognized for her impressive balance of academics and extracurricular as she is the recipient of the White House Initiative HBCU Competitiveness Scholar Award. In her spare time, 
Miss Thomas enjoys reading history books, writing fiction novels, and watching an array of documentaries. As a person, Miss Thomas is kind, loving, tolerant, and disciplined. Her personal quote is, I wish not death upon the wicked, for they need the second chances. A testament to her exemplary character. Everybody, I would like to welcome Miss Josie Thomas to the mic. just jump straight into it right all the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also but in all of them a woman is inferior to a man classic Greek philosopher Plato it is the law of nature that woman should be held under the dominance of man Chinese philosopher Confucius the words and works of God is quite clear that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. German priest and theologian Martin Luther. All these historic quotes are by successful, established, and at one time very powerful men. They were and are still hailed as distinct intellectuals and respected scholars. Young women in attendance. Did you hear the historic, intellectual, scholarly conclusions of your womanhood, your very being and existence by minds we frequently quote today and hail as great philosophers? A combination of said quotes reads like this. As a woman, your ambitions are to align with those of men, but even then you are inferior for no other reason than your gender. And when choosing your existence in life, your options range from wife to whore. Not my words, but theirs. Harsh as these words are, they are not only documented, but historical perceptions of women's ambition. I, Jose J. Thomas stand before you to combat all of these quotations. But who am I? I am neither a great philosopher, nor am I a published and immortalized theologian mind. So, who am I? What matters in this moment is who I think I am. Scratch that. Who I know I am. I am the woman telling you that Plato... Confucius, and Martin Luther, with all his divinely blessed glory, are wrong. Let's get to know each other a little better. God has blessed me to be born, like all of you, on a small island washed by the Caribbean Sea, Dominica. I came into life with no financial, socioeconomic, or demographic advantages. I am the daughter of poor but honorable men a teenage mother and farmer father to be exact. As it matters in Dominica, their last names are Tyson and Thomas, nothing quite noteworthy. I have been blessed to touch some successes in my life and I stand before you today holding a Master of Business Administration degree from Hampton University and a job as a district manager for one of the top retailers in the world. However, my journey to success starts with ambition. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines ambition as an ardent desire for rank, fame, power, or simply the desire to achieve a particular end. Personally, I like the first definition quite better because it kind of captures that sweet and salty connotation of what ambition truly is. The sweet part of ambition houses all of those positive connotations. It is the success part of ambition that will please the palate. Communicating your successes kind of rolls off your tongue. Others communicating your successes is equally as pleasing. On the other hand, the salty part of ambition houses all of those negative connotations in context, 
meaning when societal limitations are placed on ambition. For example, the statement, I want to make a million dollars, is an ambitious statement. It has a kind of positive ring to it. Who here wants to make a million dollars? Raise your hand. <laughs> Adding context kind of looks like this. If the person saying he or she wants to make a million dollars is A, unemployed, poor, or uneducated, society says, how? How will you make a million dollars? Then, depending on the individual's other demographic factors, the tone is different. Are you a man or a woman? Men are more likely to make a million dollars than women. Are you young or old? It is much harder for old people to make a million dollars. Are you from a first world country or a third world country like Dominica? Are you black or white? Are you brown or black? And so forth. B, if the person saying he or she wants to make a million dollars is already perceived as being rich or successful, then society says, why? Why do you want to make a million dollars? Again, depending on the individual's other demographic factors, the tone is different. Did you start off poor and now you have a job? Why more? Is your father a farmer and you got to America? Why more? Navigating ambition is a complicated experience filled with subtle nuances and variations depending on multiple situational factors. It is even more challenging for women. According to a study conducted by Times Magazine, here are the relevant statistics. One, men are slightly more likely to call themselves ambitious than women are while 51% of men describe themselves as very or extremely ambitious, merely only 48% of women describe themselves as such. On the flip side, more women call themselves not so ambitious or deny being ambitious altogether. A shocking 23% of women describe themselves as such. Two, women who were well into their careers were more likely to think of ambition as an unappealing feminine quality. Additionally, according to Dr. Michelle Ryan, who holds a PhD in psychology from the Australian National University, many women are just as ambitious as men when they begin their careers, but become so wearied by fighting against multiple structural and experiential barriers that this ambition often wanes, changes, decreases, or goes away. She goes on to note, and I quote, we've done the surveys for numerous professions, and whether it's police officers, surgical trainees, or women in science, men and women have absolutely equal levels of ambition and make it to the top in equal numbers, but, while men's ambition increases over time, women's tend to decrease. Research suggests that this drop is not associated with wanting to have children or stay home. It is directly re related to not having support, mentors, or role models to make it to the top and the subtle biases against women that lead to their choices, end of quote. Doesn't it all sound so grim? I am not sharing these statistics with you to disappoint or discourage you, but to tell you that with all of that, the mountains of challenges and statistical interferences, it can be done. You can do it. You can conquer ambition that will bring you success. For me, my ambitious journey and my womanhood are intertwined like it is for most women. In preschool, I was told I was quite a handful. I would regularly argue with my teachers and recruit other preschoolers to essentially start a strike against nap time. 
In an effort to correct what was seen as bad behavior, my godmother told me, little girls are to be seen and not heard. I inquisitively responded, Mikiado both. Raise your hand if you have ever been told this before. Right? You see, as a preschooler, I just wanted to be in charge. But the messaging I got was linked to my gender and what was expected of me behaviorally only because I was female. As I grew older, I would debate with my mother, who is sitting right here, and she got a test about doing my chores slash housework. While my male cousins got to run around and play outside, it just didn't seem fair to me. And when I spoke up, my mother would say, you have to learn to take care of your future husband. But you know, I'm from Marigot, so she said a little more Marigotian. Man don't want woman that can cook and clean and so whole in his boxer shorts. In that moment, I learned that my womanhood is linked to a pre-established and expected future. All I wanted were my valid points to be considered. Many hands make work light, I would say in rebuttal, but it didn't withstand the preordained value I should bring to the table as a woman. Now, I am in my 20s. I am a feminist and an advocate for women. The advice I get include, calm down, relax. It's not that serious. Along with more messaging about husbands and proper woman behavior. That won't stop, by the way. To be an ambitious woman is to be described as loud, combative, bold, osha, ashas, confident, and bossy. To master ambition as a woman is to master being okay with all of those descriptions. It is to exhale and accept that you are the girl who wants to be heard and not simply seen. It is to want what you want and to step into your own future whether you have a husband or not. Want one or not. The big question is how? How do you master ambition as a woman? I have developed a simple four-step plan I call SAS, which is essentially a pun. SAS stands for S-A-S-S, -S -S, one, self-start, two, add value, three, savor success, and four, self-start again. Self-start means creating a vision and setting future goals. It is important to dream big, bigger than the borders of Dominica. The Achilles heel of ambition is reality. When you envision where you want to be, do not be restricted by what you think is realistic. Start with the goals you simply want. Self-start for me started in grade six primary school. I was faced with the common entrance examination. My mother had a very serious talk with me about my future. She said, if you want more than what we have, you need to do well in school. Poor people go to school on scholarship. In that moment, I felt responsible for my own successes. We are all essentially responsible for ourselves and must take personal accountability for the trajectory of our lives. I set my vision on going to high school and self-started towards it. Then the A, add value. Adding value means padding your resume essentially or accumulating experiences that will get you towards the vision you self-started. It also has a component of adding value to yourself, making sure you are emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically able to achieve all of your goals. To add value to my goal of going to high school, I worked hard studying intentionally and attained a bursary rather than a scholarship at the common entrance level. Herein lies a very important lesson. 
The world does not owe you any reward for ambition, even when it is fueled by hard work. You may try with all your might and not get exactly what you were expecting. However, it is important to see ambition as a marathon rather than a sprint. Then the second S, savor success. No matter what, it is important to take a moment to savor each success to remind yourself just how far you've come. It builds self-appreciation and independence while keeping the need to quote-unquote people please and depend on congratulations from others. Pat yourself on the back, sis. The final S is to self-start all over again, making the acronym essentially a cycle. It starts with self-start and ends with self-start because you must always set a goal, add value to achieve it. Once you achieve it, do it all over again with something else even more challenging and more difficult to attain and therefore more rewarding. Then I self-started again to university. When I started high school, that was the vision and goal I set forth. I added value to achieve that goal by taking part in extracurricular activities such as netball, table tennis, volleyball, and debating in the Kiwanis de debating competition. Vital to adding value is to intentionally do so and aim to be the best at everything you do. Through adding value, I was able to savor success by graduating from the Northeast Comprehensive Secondary School with 12 CXC subjects and the Student of the Year Award, among others. Then, I self-started again and set my pursuits on going to more university. The Marga Development Corporation had an opportunity to travel to the United States for boarding school in hopes of going to a noteworthy university. At the time, I was 16 years old and already in teacher's college. It seemed like a setback to go back to essentially an American high school in hopes of eventually going to college. You see, the plan was to finish teacher's college, which was accredited, transfer to the University of the West Indies, and eventually end up in England. But when God, when man plans, God, he laughs. I went to boarding school in the U.S. and added value through continuous work and extracurricular activities. I made it to Hampton University, a top five HBCU in the U.S., and eventually graduated salutatorian with a Bachelor of Science degree in economics, accented with a minor in leadership studies. Then, what do you think I'm going to say? I self-started again and set my sights on graduate school. If you keep doing this cycle, I am positive you will master the art of ambition. But of course, there are certain character traits necessary to see this cycle through time and time again. Here is the list. Hard work versus smart work. It is important to be prepared for and be willing to work hard. While the universe owes you nothing in return for your hard work, it will still reward you. As the cliche says, aim for the moon. Even if you miss it, you land among the stars. Smart work is essentially eliminating wasted time and focusing on efficiency. Two, flexibility. As you self-start and create vision, always remain flexible and remain open to all opportunities that come your way. Do not put on blinders for one goal and realize you can achieve multiple at one time. In my experience, I always wanted to become a lawyer when I first started my career journey. <clears throat> In my first year of undergraduate, pursuing my undergraduate degree, I took one economics class. My professor, Dr. Oliver Jones, noticed I had a natural knack for business and simply proposed I change my major. I changed it the next day. That decision caused me to self-start something else and become a businesswoman. 
Because of that decision, I am even more valuable. Three, discipline. Discipline is the ability to not get distracted over a long period of time. High school is, five, is four years, five years. If you want to be valedictorian or graduate at a certain rank, that accomplishment is made by five years worth of intentional decision. Herein lies discipline. It is intentional and repeated decisions towards a very distant goal. Four, integrity. Integrity characterizes how you will feel about your accomplishments based on how you get there. Do not adopt the by any means necessary approach, but rather by every means necessary approach. This means you will not compromise your morals to attain success, but you will take all the steps necessary to achieve it. Other important character points to note are emotional intelligence, conflict resolution skills, time management, communication skills, and leadership skills. I started off this speech by sharing quotations from philosophers who said your gender sabotages your ambition. I hope that through me sharing my experience, you recognize that I am a country girl just like you. And if I can do it, you can do it too. As I conclude, I encourage all of you to be sassy. S-A-S-S -S -S, and the Y stands for you. I thank you. Now we're going to open us. <laughs> okay, now we're going to open the floor for our panelists and open the floor for some questions and discussions. I would like to introduce first Miss Jody D. Dangleben of JD's Natural. She's a civil engineer and businesswoman. Second, Ms. Luana Laurent, the creator of Finance Focus. She's a finance expert and entrepreneur. Dr. Zoraya Telemark, a general practitioner with a health and wellness focus. Jana McLawrence, an environmental specialist and safety consultant. with some questions for our panelists. First, can the members of the panel introduce themselves? Can the members of the panel please introduce themselves? Okay, good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. It's time to wake up. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I am Luana Laura. I am the founder and CEO of Finance Focus. We are a financial literacy company which teaches and coaches individuals and entrepreneurs how to manage money. How many of you like to spend money? We all do. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for having me. How many of y'all have seen my face somewhere on? <laughs> Great. So I am the owner and founder of JD's Naturals. We formulate natural and organic hair, skin, and soon-to-come household items. 
Um, another key component of my business is sharing with the young women, most of you, I think all of you, 99.9% .9 of you have natural hair, and uh, I love just educating young girls on how to take care of their hair, and uh, telling you that you are beautiful with your natural hair. So I look forward to the discussions and to getting a bit, getting to know some of you in a while. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zoraya Tanimak, Dr. Zoraya Tanimak. I'm a medical practitioner. Currently, I work mainly with babies and children. And basically, my hope and my goal for all of you is that we're all physically well, emotionally well, and mentally well to accomplish our goals and be that great woman that we want to be. So I'm looking forward to meeting you guys. Hello everyone, my name is Jana McLawrence, my middle name Loisa, and Loisa Fang Inc. is my art and design company, but my profession, I'm an environmental specialist, health and safety specialist. I'm very happy to be here, and I hope you have a lot of questions for me, and I just want to let you know that you can be whatever you want to be, and you can do it all. Okay? Thank you. So before I go into the questions that I already have, I just want to open up the floor first to see if the ladies have any questions that they are dying to ask. That they are dying to ask after the introduction and the speech. Anybody have any questions? Do not be shy. Don't be shy. All right, later. Let's get into it. For our panelists, what experiences shaped your career paths today? Um, boy, a lot. Um, I wouldn't say just one. I think, I believe that God has a plan in our life. Everything that happens, our failures, our successes, are just stepping stones for what happens. So, I didn't choose my career per se. I didn't get up one morning and just say, okay, I want to be a civil engineer. I didn't even know what a civil engineer did when I was going to school. Um, I just knew that I loved maths. Everybody asked me, what was your favorite subject? I was like, maths, are you crazy? <laughs> I love maths. I love um, dissecting stuff. So I would take my mom's whole eye and open it up. So I think that showed me that I was interested in science and field of engineering at that point. Um, and some of my values were really interacting with people. So communication, I'm very big on that. And engineering allowed me to interact with different fields. So the layman on the ground, the villagers, um, contractors, workers. Um, and as well, I, I didn't think I was cut out to remain in a job behind the desk for an entire day. So engineering again gave me the chance to work out on the field. I could hide. I ended up 200 feet deep in Wabin series the other day. So I really enjoyed the different um, experiences that I gained in the civil engineering. So I think that my values and uh, my principles sort of led me towards being an engineer. And on the entrepreneurial side, I think the fact that I am a creator naturally, I love creating, I love making new things, I love, I used to do necklaces and make earrings and make um, dresses for my dog, even though it wasn't new. But just the fact that I love working with my hands, creating stuff, and a key aspect of that was creating stuff to really help people. So my products, there was a need for, for people with natural hair to get products that work for them, products that were not um, harmful, that didn't have any harmful ingredients. So that is what propelled me really into my business and my career. Okay, so believe it or not, I was laser focused on being a banker <laughs> because I would see the ladies walking to work every day looking nice in their uniforms and you were told that bankers make a lot of money. I just wanted to be a banker. And so I had to focus on the subject, you know, maths, accounts, business, because that's what they told me bankers need. I 
after I ended college, I applied to all the banks. No vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. I never ended getting up and ended getting a banker job. I had to reprogram myself, and my first job was actually a secretary for a telecommunications business, completely way off from banking. And throughout my my tenure, you know, going to school, I realized that I love to teach. I would assist my colleagues, my schoolmates, neighborhood kids with their homework, and then gradually pursuing my degree in accounting, because, you know, that's where the money is, that's where the the money is. I realized that a big part of that was the teaching people about money, teaching people how to manage their books, how to manage their businesses, and although I work for the government, I'm an examiner at the Financial Services Unit, that has propelled me to become an entrepreneur who actually teaches people how to be in business and manage money. So the experience from a young age of loving to teach, to educate, to see people gain new knowledge, that has afforded me the opportunity to be the entrepreneur that I am. Okay, so the road for me to being a doctor was not a very straight one. So when I was five, I wanted to be a dentist. And then when I was in grade six, I heard about Ben Carson, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And then I changed my mind and said, no, 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 I'm going to be a chemical engineer instead. And then when I, as I got older, I was looking at things and I saw people in need. I saw people with health issues that needed help. And somewhere in me, it clicked. I can do this. This is what I feel I really want to do. And so I got an opportunity, and I took that opportunity, and here I am today as a doctor. So as a young child from very maybe preschool age, I always liked drawing, painting, creating things. However, I was also very academically inclined. And throughout my life, throughout my school life, I've always been told you cannot do everything. You cannot know everything and you will never be everything. So I've had a lot of, um, a lot of my ambition, I would say, would be self-driven, wanting to be, and it started out as wanting to prove, but as I got older, I realized there's nothing to prove. I am already, okay? So that's how my journey started. I really wanted to be an astronaut <laughs> when I was really young and because I always drew I used to take cardboard boxes and make houses and design them and so on. I wanted to become an architect after. I love physics, I love maps, I was the best at class with that. However, CXC had a different mind of its own <laughs> and I excelled at the natural sciences like biology and geography. I still try to do that physics and maps. At Sixth Form College, I applied for that. But at the time, it was it was not Dominica State College, it was the um, A-level, CIFO call. And they said, well, you don't get once in physics and maps, so you have to do the other subjects. I said, okay. So I did geography and biology. Went to University of the West Indies. It was um, environmental and natural resource management and also communications. In my second year, I, dis I wanted to change to an art major. But then I had a talk with my parents and they said, go, continue, just continue. Your art is your natural talent, you can always fall back on it, okay? So much of my growing up was mentored by the people around me and the people I looked up to as to what decisions to make. So I continued with my degree. Then, right after finishing my first degree, I wanted to come back home to work. My dad said, no, go back, go and do your masters. But if you come home, you might just start making children. Yeah. So I said, okay. So I went straight without graduating from my first degree. I went to my second, my second degree and graduated there for my first did my master's in occupational and environmental safety and health. Coming back home, I was fortunate to get job opportunities because that was very rare at the time. But 
something in me was never happy because I still wanted to do art. I still wanted to paint. I still wanted to draw. And you know, some years later, um, at the peak of my career in environmental and health and so on, I, I thought I'd save enough money to start an art business. And going back maybe 10, 15 years before, you can always fall back on your natural talents. So that is to say, never give up on what you're naturally good at and what makes you happy, but always have a plan B. Always have, always use your brain. What you're good at with your brain, what you're good at with your hands, everything should make up what you are. So I resigned from a very good job. <laughs> I took my savings and I opened my art business, Rosa Fang Inc. I opened a beach um, beachwear boutique because I also designed swimwear, light rain swimwear. And it was going good, but then, you know, disaster comes and according to where you are, you're unable to bounce back. And that is where your education comes in. Because of my education, I was able to start work and put my business aside for some time. So throughout the day, we'll get to learn about what I consider hobbies, um, busyness, business is a busyness, all right? You take breaks, you balance your brain and your heart, which is what you like to do and what you want, what you can do. And I forgot this fourth one, but throughout the day, <laughs> we'll get there. So basically, life is about balance, making the right choices and taking up opportunities. And you can, you can be a chef today, you can be a teacher tomorrow, you can be an engineer next day. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you are able to do what you are doing and that you are passionate about it and that you can make a difference in someone's life. My business has allowed me to bring happiness to people. The, um, one of my businesses is Sip and Paint. So when I do Sip and Paint with people, I see that it releases some stress they meet new friends, they learn something new, and that makes me happy. So whereas my job, nine, 10 hours a day, five days a week, six days a week, gives me stress, when I'm with people in my business, it makes me feel fulfilled. Okay, so you can do it all, and that's my contribution. This question is for Jodi, Jana, and Luana. As women in business, what challenges have you faced and how did you overcome said challenges? <laughs> I've had a lot of challenges. Uh, one of them um, is perception. Okay, so perception, perception. A lot of people see you, but they don't know who you are. And one of the things that I've learned is that the whole life that you live is a stage and you are the starring in your movie. You in your head know who you are, but other people based on their um, own experiences, their, what they think about life, they will have a perception of you. So that in itself on a personal level is a challenge. Um, trying not to prove anything, but doing the best that you can. That in itself is a challenge when people have perceptions. A second thing is um, location and population. We all know that we're in an island, but it's not the most populated island. And for certain businesses, you need a large population to sustain you. So you constantly have to be reinventing the wheel, thinking of new ways, recosting re your service or your goods, so population has been a challenge, and also perception. Um, you all have beds, because this might take over. <laughs> where do I start? So just to continue from where Jan said about the population and location, that is maybe my main challenge, location in terms of actually um, exporting my products so I have done a lot when it comes to marketing and getting access to markets regionally and internationally that point was fire <laughs> yeah so that has been my 
different challenge. Can you imagine that the post office is still closed to this day? Yeah. Wow. I hope all you listening. <laughs> so it's been a real challenge for me to get my products out of Dominica. Um, and because of that, I sort of stalled because there was the option of DHL and FedEx, which is very expensive. But there was an experience where there was a lady from England who had come down on vacation and she wanted the products. When she went back, she contacted me and said, there's no way I can send it, except the PHL, which is very expensive. It's more than the cost of the products. And she said, I don't care, I will pay for it. And that got me to thinking, well, if the products are so good and people want them, I might as well just make it available. And people still continue to buy. So um, that goes to show that even though there is a challenge, try to work around. There are always ways that you can get to to make a challenge a stepping stone, you know, to make your business successful. Another challenge that I face, we talked about perception again, um, because I am so out there in terms of social media, people think I make it, I don't make it yet. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, People think that, you know, I'm well established, and, uh, but that's not the case. And so sometimes I really have to make a case, especially locally for funding and those sort of things. So financial aid and grants locally has been a major issue. So that's why I even had to sort of step outside Dominica and see what I can get originally in terms of grant funding, technical assistance, and those sort of things. I think also I didn't have a lot of mentoring. There were not many people in my field, you know, doing products and manufacturing. So there wasn't anybody that I could go to. I was sort of working blindly, you could see. Um, but I think the, the climate has, has changed now, and I am available now after all what I've learned to help people coming up to get through these challenges. And I think. Um, the climate is one where why business in Dominica. If you are not mentally prepared and if you don't have support and if you don't see or have that tunnel vision of your end goal, you will become frustrated. Um, and so I think mentorship, that's where mentorship comes in. And it's very important to have that support that somebody you can go to to talk about those things and just encourage me. So I, I have to thank the Dominican public because people have been really encouraging me through my business. I mean, there are time, many times I have been frustrated, but they egg me to continue. So I have to be thankful for that. But those are my many challenges. Getting things in Dominica, oh my God, the custom duties. Woo! Let's not go there. But um, I think it has been changed. Yeah, this has been a very, very slow process. Um, so now there are different incentives for manufacturers where I can get some beauty all for packaging. But I think there's much more that can be done on a policy level. Government is <laughs> on a policy level to really help manufacturers, help the small businesses. Because they have been helping the bigger businesses that are already established. And the small businesses, I think, are those in the grassroots community level that maybe we, we help the community even more than the bigger businesses. So I think a lot more, a lot, a lot more has been done on that front, and especially women entrepreneurs. We are here to help us. Thank you. Okay, so one of my main challenges in business was what is my age. From primary school, I was always one of the youngest people in the class because I got skipped, and through high school, through college. Because of your age, you feel that you have to prove yourself so people can respect you or take you serious. And that sort of translated into my business, coming into the field that I am, you are expected to have a lot of education, a lot of experience that you can, you know, share with people. And with our small communities, you know, you would have one of the big surgeons that people know about. It, it puts additional pressure on you to prove yourself so people can know that the type of business that you have, you can make a difference, you can make an impact. So in order for me to overcome that, I had to create my own opportunities. 
I had to find myself in, in rooms where there were people older than me, where I could develop mentorship relationship with these individuals and sort of prove myself first to myself. And then they saw that eventually they started respecting me for my craft because I respected what I did. I, show, I showed confidence in what I did in delivering my, my service and the products. And over time, you gain that respect from the community. So for those of you who may be young, you know, people may not take you seriously. Do not let that inhibit you. In, inhibit you. Believe in yourself, have confidence in yourself first, and tell yourself you can do it. I'm following up from Jody, mentorship. Mentorship signifies your growth. You need help. Always look for people who can take you a step further. Surround yourself with friends who can elevate you. Try to get into rooms where they're having conversations that you can contribute to. In that way, you can overcome many of the challenges just like what we have shared. This question is for Dr. Telemark. How important do you think health and wellness is to achieving your success? Okay, so on the importance of health and wellness. So firstly, we have to consider that health is not only physical, but it's also a mental and an emotional thing. My body has to be okay. My mind and my thoughts has to be okay. And my feelings, how I feel about life, has to be in a good place. So I have to make all these things, put them into a balance, and then I can move forward. So it is super, 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 extra, super important that I take care of all these aspects of my life. As a girl, as a teenager, I start there. How do I treat my body? How do I feel about my body? What do I put into my body? Do I exercise? Am I healthy? Am I taking care of myself? So you ask yourself those questions and you work on that. It might be difficult in some of our circumstances, but we are going to try and we are going to make the effort to take care of ourselves. Then we have to take care of our thoughts. Do you have any negative thoughts? Sometimes you have to stop the negative self-talk. When your mind say, I cannot do that, you have to say, yes, I can. When you have all those thoughts coming into your mind, you just have to block them off, change the negative into a positive, and then continue on from there. And your feelings. Some days we are up, some days we are down. I know sometimes when we get our period, we are nobody close to us and everybody stay far. But we have to learn to manage that and combine everything together, work it out, and little by little we accomplish our goals and we get to be the women we want to be. So that's basically it. Changing the tone just a little bit, education can be expensive. What are some ways that you could probably fund your education for those of us in the room on a budget? Anybody could take this one. Okay, for those of us who don't have access or family members that can help you get a loan or cash, larger shares to go to school, um, there are scholarships available. You can look for yourself or ask someone older than you or someone you think that can help you to look for available scholarships, if it's through your government or or community leader. Just like I think you spoke about, there was the Marigold development, right? So grasp those opportunities when you hear about them. If you hear about it, you tell your parents, you tell your auntie, your older your brother. And also, if you have a cause, for example, if you're passionate about maybe uh, domestic violence or, or social issues or environmental issues, if you use your phone a lot to go on things like TikTok and so, use it to go on Google and search something. For example, you like cats and dogs, search how you can go to a school who is given a scholarship for veterinary medicine or something. And as Jody and Luana and Doctor said, always have mentors, always have people around you that can guide you. Use the internet to your advantage and for your future. Use the internet to search for things. For example, you grow up poor or you don't have any money or land for you to go to school or get a scholarship. Google how you can get a scholarship through something that you are interested in. 
okay so for example what is all the sports yes sports athletics if you're good at athletics you can find scholarships in that so whatever your passion is about or have an interest in there is some school somewhere in the world giving a scholarship for that so use the internet wisely Jana said, if you are in a situation where you have limited funding, limited opportunities, it starts now. Like, jo like Josie said, you need to make yourself marketable from now. Add value to your community. In this world right now, there's a lot of reward for volunteers. So volunteer within your community, in your churches, and the opportunities will present themselves. Also, on the financial side of things, start saving. Yes. If somebody gives you $100 a day, put $20 aside in your credit union. Small bits grow into large amounts. So it doesn't matter how much money you have, put a little bit aside every day, but make yourself marketable and save what you can. And just to tell you guys as well, if any of you attend, I think all of you attend the Northeast Comprehensive Secondary School, no, most of you, well, um, I started a scholarship award called the Christine J. Thomas Scholarship Award, and it's for a graduating senior that has academic excellence that comes first, but also something amazing outside of the classroom. It can be sports, philanthropic efforts, and currently it's a $500 scholarship award. So that's what I was talking about earlier about discipline and how discipline really starts from your age right now. So if you already know that your family situation is a, uh, financially challenging, I already say I'm giving you $500. You can go up and down, back and forth to Rosa Dominica State College or you can put in your application to go to a university, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. One thing, just to share my experience. Everything that you do, put your all into it. You might think that there are some subjects in school that, what am I doing in French? What am I doing in Spanish? But all the experience that you have, all the opportunities to learn, be very intentional. Because the first place I went, I mean, my mom and dad were working, but to actually send somebody to university is a lot of money. I had to go to Cuba. Spanish comes in. Then I got a scholarship, a crack of wood scholarship to go to Canada. And it was because I really took interest in my French classes that I got awarded a scholarship. So every little thing that you do, make sure you put your all to it. Never say, oh, I might, what I do in algebra, you need algebra. Right? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so everything that you do in school, don't think that it's, it's you know, it's just a, a passer. You don't need it. Be intentional about everything that you do. Put your all into it because you never know what would, would come up your way, opportunities that may come your way where you might have to fall back on you. Let's talk a little bit about personal relationships for these young girls. How can they speak to their family dynamic, especially functioning within the barriers of our culture? So for example, if all of us are young girls here, how do they come out and communicate with their mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, in a way that is not automatically deemed as disrespectful? I just think, well, times are changing. I mean, you really have to, you have to impress on your parents that times are changing. The traditions that we had about rules to be seen and not heard, it's changing. I mean, we all have our voices. And even, I have to talk about this, even coming on the heels of those sexual cases, I think some of it stems from the fact that we don't feel comfortable to talk to our elders, to talk to our parents, to talk to people in the community. We feel a sort of, you know, we like we're not, I would say not important, but that we should not be learned and, and it still exists in our society. So we really need to impress our parents. Mommy, this is how I'm feeling, this is how I this I feel. Mommy, this is how I feel. Daddy, this is how I feel. Don't say that you're doing this to me or mommy. This is how I feel when you do certain things. This is how it makes me feel. Um, I think I'm um, using that approach. They might 
open up and be a little more warm towards your feelings and your experiences and that might open up communication more between between you and your parents. So so use I feel, I feel, I feel hurt when you do this to me. I don't feel so loved. I feel that a lot in words. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that would sort of open up communication. I think that that can start to, you know, make them listen to you more, listen to your concerns. Okay, something else when planning to talk to your parents or whoever is in your family is you make a plan. <laughs> it's like you're going to war and you have a plan. You have, if you're going to, you say, for example, you want, you need a hundred dollars to do something, you have all the points of why I need it. You can even write down your plan. So you come, you're presenting it like you're presenting it for a business, like you're presenting something to your parent. You're trying to convince them. So you go with that idea, that mentality. I'm going to talk to mommy. Can you say, Mommy, can I have a little meeting with you at 5:30? I really need to discuss something with you. And you have your paper written down with your points, and they'll take you more seriously than if you just shout it out or blurt it out or come at it anyway. Okay, so that's something we can consider as well. Sticking to the personal relationship, describe a time in your life where your professional and personal or Describe a time in your life, either professionally or personally, where you felt discouraged. How did you overcome that feeling? <laughs> wow. I'm going to start here. We're live, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I started working public service at age 19 and you know with the challenges of attaining advancement and being secure in your job it takes a while I educated myself got my bachelor's still no promotion got my master's still trying to get the promotion and it took quite a while to actually get established in my position. That can be discouraging because you invest in yourself, you look for the opportunities and the system can keep you back. But how did I overcome that? Remember, we spoke about proving to ourselves first. I kept motivated. I started looking for other opportunities. I became creative. I look for ways to use my degrees that would add value to my community and to my family and myself. And I stay positive. You have to affirm what you want. There is a spirit that follows you when you're intentional, when you declare what you want. And although it took some time, I eventually got what I want. But in addition to that, I also made a business. So stay positive and affirm what you want. Describe, describe the most successful experience you had and highlight the resources you think necessary to achieve said success. I would have to speak about my business. Um, when I started Light Rain Swimwear, it was based on me wanting other women to feel confident in a swimsuit because culturally, I would go to the beach in my swimsuit and then there are some women with a swimsuit and a pants on because they're not as confident about their lower half or their stomach or whatever, or their long hands. So I, designed, I started designing swimwear and I started with just one person sewing with me and doing my designs. And I was successful with four seasons, four, four different um, collections, and that was going good. I had a niche market. I had women who wanted that type of swimwear, you know, that would cover certain areas that they're insecure about, and also make them feel um, beautiful. That was a success story, and also with the 
art session, sip and paint. Um, when I started it, everybody was on board, you know, people, it was one of the first to do it here, and a lot of people participated, and my clientele grew. Then I had return customers, and I realized that it's not just about the product or the service, but you become the business eventually. You, your personality, the way you deal with customers, the way you deal with, with people, and your quality of your products. It becomes you and you are the business. So, for the, young, for the young girls who may be confused or unsure about what they want to be, how would you advise them? Wow. Okay, that has happened to me. I have been confused <laughs> and I wasn't sure. And guess what? It might happen later on in life. Again, you might be unsure about something else. It doesn't just go away turn 18 or turn 20 and you have no more confusion that doesn't happen so tell yourself you know what I'm not sure about something right now but it's okay it is okay to be unsure and from there you take planning again take steps to try to figure it out sometimes you have to wait out get a paper put benefits put disadvantages and wait out and you have to think about it in that way sometimes to help you get through that confusion but one thing you have to be, one thing you have to tell yourself, I am not sure right now, but guess what? It's okay. I will figure it out. And you take steps towards that, towards that goal. Now, finally, for all of our panelists, how would you describe your brand of womanhood? How would you describe your brand of womanhood? Start with, my womanhood is... just jump on it first trust me so for me i really take my womanhood extremely extremely seriously as you guys know i'm a feminist and what that means is i believe in the socioeconomic equality of the sexes and so when i think of my womanhood the first thing that comes to my brand is unapologetic so because I'm a woman, I'm only five foot three, you know, sometimes I don't get taken as seriously. And because I speak how I speak or I'm confident, a lot of times I get easily dismissed or a lot of that verbiage about calm down, calm down. But me can't stay calm, right? I cannot stay calm and a big part of my womanhood is just being unapologetically myself. So I would encourage everybody in the room, all of the young girls, take a second to figure out who you are. What do you like? Not what your mother telling you to like, your father telling you to like, your little boyfriend. Figure out what you like and then be unapologetically you. Okay, so I would say my womanhood, it would be based on whatever comes i am pushing forward maria come i go in forward you reject me for the scholarship i go in forward you bank don't want to give me a loan i am going forward no matter what happens it will not stop me it will not deter me from my goal i am going forward so keep that in mind ladies and let's go on forward my womanhood is addictive. Why? Because I just go for no one. Like, like I do what I want to do. Once it's not affecting anybody else, it's not hurting anybody. I do what I want to do. Once I'm passionate about something, I don't care what this person has to say, what anybody has to say. I like, sometimes I have blinders and I just move forward with everything that I'm doing. For me, failure, like I love, I love to fail sometimes. Some people, they get very depressed and it can really steer them off their path when they fail. But to me, I enjoy it. It's like a challenge to me. When I fail, that I get an opportunity to do something and do something better than what I intended on doing before. Um, I think I can do everything and anything. I'm divinely created. God can do anything. He made me this image and likeness. So I, woman, can do anything that I put my mind to. I can drive a bobcat, I can drive an excavator, I can drive a front loader, I can
and we knew in a mob cast. I did it because I tried it and I wanted to say, go, 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 do. Ah. <laughs> and that, I mean, it's, it was said in a bad way, but I think having that attitude that I have was what actually made me who I am to be. Being very inquisitive, being passionate about everything I do in sports. I mean, when I was in school as a sports captain, I took part in every single race because I wanted points for my house. Even though I didn't know how to do job, the job it was thrown somewhere. I got a point. So I think I that that way that Duban is about me is what has me here today. I see something that I want and I drive towards. There's a grant. I'll tell my husband, you know that one is mine. That grant is mine. You see that award there? That is mine. Look, mine in it. So everything, and I work towards it. Even if I have to stay up three, four, five o'clock in the morning to do it, I will do it because I already see my name on that plaque. So be intentional, think about other women. So what you do, you're not in a vacuum, you live in a community, everything that you do will affect someone else. It may not seem that way, but it does. What you do, be it positive or negative, will affect somebody else. There are little children looking up to you and you might not know. There might be others in your classroom, in your school looking up to you. So everything you do, make sure that it has that positive impact that others can emulate what you do, and others maybe might think about doing something and be afraid and see you doing it, so now they think that they can as well. So always have that in the back of your mind. My woman who is addicted. Okay. My womanhood is self-aware. Now as young ladies, as young women, we are biologically emotional. So we need to be aware of our emotions. We need to be aware of who we are so that we can adapt to our environment. And I don't say this to be judgmental, but as Jody said, you know, people will say women are supposed to be seen and not heard, but there is a place and time for everything, right? Be yourself at all times, but there's a place and time for everything. If self-awareness, it has actually helped me to acclimatize myself in different circles. And that in itself has given me more opportunities. So always be aware of your surroundings. Whenever somebody is making you uncomfortable, let them know that you're uncomfortable. Whenever you feel excited, it's okay to show that. You know, you want something, don't downplay your excitement. Just be mindful of your environment with around how you would like to express yourself, okay? So just have that level of self-awareness. That concludes our girlhood in Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. <laughs> so my womanhood is a divine splendid journey. And as I said before, all the world is a stage and we all play in a part, so my journey has been one of many parts, but as Luana said, you have to know how to be self-aware and express yourself properly and in the right forum, how you want to do that. So my womanhood is a divine journey and every woman is an individual and has their own divine journey. I apologize. I forgot you two times today and I am so sorry. I don't know what came over me. But this finally concludes our Girlhood Influencers Dialogue. We want to thank our panelists so much for being here and sharing all of your experience with us. Thank you guys so much for coming. Go ahead and give them a huge round of applause. And of course, this would not be made possible without Miss Valerie herself. Thank you so, so, so much for bringing this together. It was an amazing and remarkable philanthropic effort. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, guys. So now we'll break for brunch and networking. Just before we break, I don't know if any, I don't want to miss anybody that has questions for you all. So if anybody has questions, we want to give you the opportunity to ask. You can ask some now, and then you can ask when you get to interact with them on a one-on-one -on -one in a while. So I know we had some questions on this side. We're just going to open up for two questions.
girls or young people in our age group who want to start a business or a small business. Um, you need to do a lot of research and development. Uh, and it's very important. Um, most likely, if you have a business idea, somebody else has already done it. So don't reinvent the wheel. Watch the wheel and improve upon it. So if the wheel is black, make it red. Um, so I think you have to do a lot of research. If it's a business idea that already exists, do a lot of research and try to don't mimic whole wholesale. Try to put your own spin, your own personality on your business. So, for example, people are doing like resin, um, keychain, or whatever. Do something else. If they're using flowers, use sea stones or seashells. Do something else and make sure that your marketing strategy sets you apart from what already exists. So that would make sure that your business is unique. It's not just a photocopy of something else, and that you can always market um, properly. So it's a new, it would be like a new a reincarnation of something else. So that's my advice. Just to add, just to add to you, you made a, a statement to start a business. To note, there is a difference between a small business owner and an entrepreneur. Business owner is one who owns a business for profit. Hopefully the business gets successful and they make a profit. An entrepreneur, on the other hand, that person is intuitive, they're creative, they're flexible, you know, they're diligent. So take a look at yourself within your self-introspection and ask yourself, do I have the qualities to become an entrepreneur? That in itself will guide you along the way. Question. How do you separate your personality from your business? So, to explain, there are times when I would be described as, oh, you're too nice, you're nice, you're nice, you're nice. No, because I am nice, when it comes to business, people see it as a pathway to exploit because you are nice. So sometimes I have to step back and try to figure out how do I not be nice when it comes to business. In that case, I think it's important to have policies for your business, have a business plan, so you can say, as per section 2.3, this is what I can and cannot do. So you sort of separate your own personality from your business structure. So those terms would determine how you react in certain cases. So I think that's important to have a business plan, have like what you would call, what should I do, like a procedural manual, what should I do in different cases. It's almost like a risk management plan, sort of. So you think about different things. People might approach you for a discount and those sort of things. What do you do in that state? Well, as per my business manual, this is what I can do. And right. so it, it, it's not something objective. It's not something you have to say, well, you're my sister and in power where I should be going. <laughs> so I think that's important to have those structures in your business. Thank you. I just want to add something too, right? So in my study of business, even though I don't own a business myself, it is important to have a distance between yourself as the owner and the business. So depending on where your business is, for example, if you're the only employee, it's going to be more difficult to put that distance between yourself and the customer. And one thing that I like to do, because uh, when I was a TA, I would put a lot of distance between myself and the students. So the way to do that is to create like a separate email and like limit how many people have access to you. Sometimes you they can describe you as being like not nice or you harsh or you think you make it, you need that peace. So in order to do that, I would say a backup number that only is for business. If somebody message you on your personal phone, just close your eyes to it. A personal email and start talking in third person. So talking on behalf of the company that gives the customer the perception, even though it might just be you, it gives the customer the perception that there are other people in between. So start your emails like, here at x Corporation. I tell you late. So here at x Corporation, we do, we, yes. So put that healthy distance between. 
Thank you very much. You took the words. You have to separate yourself from your business. So your friend might want to, um, you know, get your service or your goods or whatever. But even if it's your friend, say this is the number you contact, even though it's you in the other number. And then you say, can you please send me your email address? I'll send you all the details. And sometimes too, you don't always have to be the face of your business. You can be behind. So all is protecting, as you said, your peace as a person. Any other questions, ladies? All right. So as we break, we're about to break for brunch and networking. And we want to thank MO News for streaming this segment of our Girlhood Brunch. When we come back, we're going to have some table dialogue. You're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with these amazing ladies. You're going to get to ask all the questions that you have, and you're going to get to learn way more. All right? So we invite you to break for brunch. And thank you very much. Thank you to all our viewers online. Thank you to everybody that's supporting Nair and Pa. We appreciate you being here with us today. Thanks. If you're just joining us, we're live. Okay, at girls, so we go in. in Kalabishi for As the She Wins Girlhood Brunch. We just witnessed a panel of amazing entrepreneurs as well as Doctor, who has voiced their skill set or their mindset on what women need to do to move forward. Right now we are breaking up for brunch. We just want to thank everyone for joining us live. It is indeed insightful and very, very important for these young women, especially those within the high school and college age groups who are interested in opening their own businesses or perhaps setting a path in life. So we would like to thank the organizers for doing such a wonderful job and for creating this opportunity to all these young ladies who are present today. As usual, it is indeed our pleasure to bring you this live coverage. MO News remains committed to keeping you informed and updated on everything that's happening around Dominica.